Uh, thanks uh, for everyone who's uh, participating. The, um, the opportunity to speak to folks is something I always jump at. Um, I have to say that I'm um, not less enthusiastic, but a bit more intimidated by the idea of doing it online. And you would think it would be an easier gig, right? I mean, you're not actually looking at people face to face, but uh, this is more intimidating to me than standing in front of a live audience. So there's those things about imagining people in their underwear, which also has less effect online, but uh, I'll, I'll get through it one way or the other. Um, I do want to visit about Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park. It is such an exciting place. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the Nature Conservancy in general because uh, I'm shamelessly uh, proud of what we do. And uh, a little bit about some other places that you might visit around Kansas. If you're just looking for a place to get a breath of fresh air and, um, and see something wild and beautiful, there's tons of opportunities in this state. I am uh, almost a lifelong Kansan at least so far. Uh, I've lived here about 50 years. Um, I think I just told you how old I'm older than. Um, and I love Kansas. I love Kansas because I'm an outdoors person. I love Kansas because I'm a bird watcher. I love Kansas because I'm a hiker and I love Kansas because I love the people here. And uh, it's, it, it's just a great place to be if you love the outdoors. So, <clears throat> As I said, we're going to talk about Little Jerusalem, but I'm going to take a little bit of a detour first, if you'll go with me, please. And at the end, I'm going to try to leave a little time for questions. So, Allison or Laura, would you like give me a thumbs down or something when I get to like 45 minutes or something so I know to speed up or whatever? Okay. Um, so, every organization has a mission, and every mission statement is poorly written by someone's perspective, but this is ours. Uh, we want to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And I think we should italicize all. But to explain, we mean that um, our conservation is for nature, but we always recognize that it has to be good for people, too. And that's, um, that's really who we are. It's where we live and it's where we operate, in part because um, we believe it's the right thing and in part because it's good business. Uh, if what we do is good for people, then they protect it. It's that simple. Good for their for their income, for their communities, for their families, uh, for their cultures. And we very, very much focus on that with a lot of fidelity to the best available science. A little bit of history about the Na Nature Conservancy. Um, we're uh, roughly 70 years old, in fact, 70 years old this year as a global organization. Um, there was an outfit called the Ecologists Union that renamed themselves the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they did it in conjunction with, uh, there was a place uh, in, in New York called Mianus Gorge. And Mianus Gorge was this beautiful natural area of old growth forest with just a few houses around it. And I think it was 80 acres, maybe 40 acres, not very big by Kansas standards. And a developer had determined to buy and develop it into small housing lots and the people of the area talked to some of their naturalist ecologist friends and said, you know, th this is not right. What do we do about this? And around that cause, they formed the Nature Conservancy. They bought this place. They managed it for its ecological assets. And that became the Nature Conservancy's business plan for a long time. Not long after that, in the 1960s, uh, the Conservancy um, uh, started undertaking its first large land acquisitions and in the late 1960s um, the Conservancy did something called a conservation easement for the first time. Conservation easement 101 very condensed is this. Every land has a bunch of development rights with it. A land trust like the Nature Conservancy or Ducks Unlimited or Pheasants Forever or the Kansas Land Trust. A land trust can buy some of those development rights away and retire them. And therefore, the ecological assets can be perfect, per, protected by that. So that oh, was well, the one second. there. You go. You need to click through. Yeah, that was the conservancy's um, business model into the 1960s, uh, even more so in the 1970s. Another thing that happened in the 1970s was the conservancy began to look uh, more at large landscape conservation, recognizing that. We could buy all the 40 acre tracks we wanted to, but we would never really conserve ecosystems by doing that. 
also recognizing that we could never buy enough land of any size to conserve ecosystems. So um, in the 1970s, science also began to move more to the forefront and something called the Natural Heritage Inventory was started or the Natural History Inventory. And uh, at Kansas, there's one in, I think at every land grant college or every uh, major university across the country. I may not be, there may be a few states that lack them. In Kansas, the Kansas, uh, the Kansas Biological Survey resides at the University of Kansas. Um, and it was spun off by the Nature Conservancy in the 1970s. In the 1980s, the Conservancy, uh, though it was a US formed organization, began to realize that, that uh, ecosystems are not always confined to one continent and we began to work internationally. For example, birds that nest in Canada spend part of it, the, they rest in the fall and the spring in Kansas and spend their winters in the southern tip of, of Argentina. So we began to recognize to save species and ecosystems, we had to work internationally. In the 1990s, um, we started to really think more about bringing the best science to bear and the best economics under something called conservation by design. And I promise I'm gonna get through this history pretty quickly. Um, and conservation by design basically asks this question, how do we apply the best science and the best economics in the best cooperation with communities and families and cultures to make sure that the conservation we do is large enough to be meaningful and strong enough to, to endure. Today, the Nature Conservancy works in every state in the US, 70-some uh, countries and territories around the world, and virtually every continent on the planet. Um, we are the largest conservation organization in the world. And I think our success depends on not only on science and respect for the needs of people, but also on the fact that you don't, you don't read our name in the headlines about lit environmental litigation. That's simply not the way we work. We look for, for ways to collaborate, ways that there are more than one winner uh, in, in our environmental battles, and that uh, we don't alienate potential partners for the future. Very important to us. So that's a little bit of overview of what we do globally and where we started. Talk about Kansas just a little bit. You might recognize some of those areas. The dark green blob on your right is the Flint Hills and the red blob on the bottom is the Red Hills. Uh, the Smoky Hills are the lighter green blob, blob and uh, the rest you either know or you don't know because they're somewhat obscure to a lot of people. Um, we do have the Ozarks down in the Southeast. There's the Red Hills. Uh, those are the Chalk Bluffs region. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Those are the Smoky Hills. Uh, these are two really important wetland complexes, Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivira National Wildlife Refuge. Talk a bit more about those in a minute. Um, the Nature Conservancy in Kansas has only recently begun to work in streams, and I will say this as a teaser. Kansas streams are probably the most abused and neglected natural feature in the state and maybe among the most abused and neglected in the country. And I don't mean that to be inflammatory, I'm just telling it like it is. But you all came to hear about Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park, so we'll start with that as our feature. What a fantastic area this is. And I would tell you that um, going back to my very earliest days with the Conservancy, now going on 16 years ago, I would periodically go and talk to the people who own this piece of land and say, would you be willing to sell it to us? And they always either said no or politely quoted me a price that I knew I could never afford. So this went on for um, 15, 14 or 15 years. And one day we got a call uh, from the McGuire family and they said, we would like for you to buy Little Jerusalem. And um, my first reaction was, well, I don't have the money for that. And then some of our board leaders, some of our benefactor, by the way, Kelly Callen, uh, one of our trustees from Wichita is on the call tonight. When our board leadership said, yes, Rob, you do have the money, go buy it and we'll figure it out. So we did. Um, in, in 2019, we bought Little Jerusalem Badlands. It's only about 300 acres. It's one of the smallest properties we've, we've uh, purchased in recent time. Um, you can tell by looking at this picture right here that 
It's got a lot of relief to it. It's Niobrara chalk formations, <clears throat> which by the way are the same ones that are expressed in the Badlands of the Dakotas, if you're familiar with those. Um, and it's just a, a geologically and ecologically fantastic area. And you can see in the background in this photo that there's beautiful short grass prairie in the background. By the way, this is in Logan County, straight south of Oakley. It's just a fantastically beautiful place. Um, ferruginous hawks are among the species that are somewhat unique to it, that live amongst its spires. Uh, there's a very nice trail system developed there. Uh, Laura Rose Clausen on my staff who helped put this together also did the supervise the trail development. It is a wonderful place to take your family. The cool thing about Little Jerusalem Badlands, Badlands State Park from, from my perspective is one of the things we knew we would do from the beginning is open it to the public. But frankly, the Nature Conservancy is not, um, we're, we're not really good at that. It's not what we do. We, we conserve lands, but providing public access is not necessarily in our wheelhouse. Um, and we knew there would be a lot of interest in this place with the trails and the scenic beauty. I'm gonna go back a couple slides. I know I'm not supposed to do that, Laura, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, it's just such a beautiful place. I gotta show it off a couple more times. We knew there'd be a lot of people who wanted to come and hike the trails there and sit in places like this and breathe in the freshest air you can imagine. And <clears throat> so, that being maybe above our pay grade as an organization, we went to the Department of Wildlife and Parks and said, would you be interested in operating this? And the leadership of Wildlife and Parks at the time said, yes, we'd love to, but we have to get the legislature's permission. Well, it didn't take the Kansas legislature long to figure out that this was a place that they wanted to have open to their constituents. And so uh, the Nature Conservancy continues to own it. Um, we uh, have a, a long-term license with the Department of Wildlife and Parks to operate it for public access. And it's there for the people of Kansas for a long, long time. Trails, um, there's restrooms there. Uh, it's just a, it's a fantastic place. Everybody ought to go see it. Right next to, actually touching on the southeast corner of Smoky Valley Ranch is Little Jerusalem. Smoky Valley Ranch is about a 17,000 acre a uh, working ranch that we own that is operated and managed uh, adjunct to uh, Little Jerusalem Badlands State Park. It is not a state park and not open the way a state park is, but there are trails on it and we do welcome people to come hike on Smoky Valley Ranch. Um, there are bison and as you can see in the background, pronghorn on the place. And it also has incredible scenic beauty with some uh, some less dramatic outcrops of the Niobrara chalk formations. One of the things uh, that you probably won't see, but you can have the satisfaction of knowing it's there, are black-footed ferrets on Smoky Valley Ranch. Um, black-footed ferrets eat only prairie dogs. So if you're a prairie dog, they're not your friend. Uh, they are the rarest mammal in North America. At one time, there were only 14 black-footed ferrets known to exist in the world. Uh, which is functionally extinct. And they have been uh, reintroduced through captive propagation and they now exist on Smoky Valley Ranch. And uh, you can see prairie dogs there and other allied species like burrowing owls, little tiny owls, that big, that live in the prairie dog holes along with the black-footed ferrets and the rattlesnakes. Uh, but it's just a magnificent place. One of the few places in the world you could even have a chance of seeing a black-footed ferret. I mentioned that Smoky Valley Ranch has some trails. Uh, on the northwest corner of the ranch, uh, there's about three trail loops and they're easy walking and a fantastic place to go and get a breath of fresh air. Kanza Prairie Research Preserve is just uh, down the road from where I live in Wabunsee County. If you're a K-Stater, as Allison is, I understand, you've probably been on Kanza. Um, it is one of the most visited areas <laughs> in Kansas, in part because it's close to Manhattan, and there's a very nice trail system on a little corner of the property. <clears throat> As the name implies, Kansas is, is operating primarily for biological research, and it is one of, uh, one of the 
one of the uh, member properties in the long-term ecological research system that spans across North America and into other countries, where data on climate change and precipitation has been collected for decades, and these long-term data sets are really important to us. The major portion of the grazing at Kanza focuses on the intersection between fire and grazing and economics and ecological well-being. So when you go to Kanza, if you take a tour of it, you'll see little signs all over the place with symbols on them. And these symbols stand for every permutation you can think of, of being grazed by cattle, not being grazed at all, being grazed by bison, being burned, being not burned, being burned with cattle, being burned without cattle or with bison or without bison. All these permutations of grazing and burning by different animals are studied at Kanza. And as you can see here, it is a vast and beautiful place. Kanza is about 9,000 acres. And it's operated by Kansas State uh, and the Nature Conservancy continues to own it. Also some wonderful historic buildings on Kanza that are, are well worth seeing. Cheyenne Bottoms globally is probably the most famous of all the properties that the Nature Conservancy holds an interest in. Um, Cheyenne Bottoms, uh, the entire basin is about 21,000 acres. Uh, it is considered by some experts to be the most important inland migration stopover for migratory birds in North America. Um, some estimates are that as many as five migratory bird species rely on Cheyenne Bottoms for their existence. I wouldn't take that figure to the bank. Suffice it to say, it's a very, very important migratory bird area. I'm gonna give a little personal history here. I spent uh, the first 20 years of my professional career with the Department of Wildlife and Parks. And one of the things that plagued me most when I was there was the fact that the 19,000 acres that the Department of Wildlife and Parks owned there often cause flooding on about 10,000 acres of private farmland around it. Uh, we were sued and lost a few times. The money was significant. The hindrance to operation was significant and we didn't know what to do about it. The legislature had our hands tied. We couldn't buy the land. And one day I thought I heard trumpets in the background and riding to the rescue was this organization called the Nature Conservancy that I didn't even know existed in Kansas. And this would have been in 1988, 89, somewhere in there. And the Nature Conservancy came in and began buying from willing cooperative sellers this farmland on the north and east, north and west side of Cheyenne Bottoms that we had been flooding. And the Nature Conservancy eventually bought almost 9,000 acres there and restored the wetland values, relieved the farmers of the stress of worrying about the flooding, paid them a fair market value for their land, and everybody, including millions of migratory birds, came away a winner from the deal that the Nature Conservancy struck there. Um, so to date, with what the state owns and what we own, there's over 20,000 acres uh, owned and managed for uh, ecological purposes, primarily for migratory bird habitat, uh, but also for public recreation uh, and public access. And the Conservancy owns, uh, if you're looking at uh, Looking at that slide there, uh, the Conservancy owns most of what is to the north and east. Some of the species you see at Cheyenne Bottoms include whooping cranes, and I would just tell a quick story. I, I had uh, former Governor Bill Graves at Cheyenne Bottoms once, and um, we could see whooping cranes about a mile out into the central pool, and I was so excited. Um, and as I was explaining to the governor what a hooping crane looked like, two birds flew up just like this, about 15 feet over our heads. It was magnificent. Cheyenne Bottoms is host to lots of hooping cranes. Uh, it's open for public hunting during certain times of the year, but it also have a has a refuge that is never open for public hunting. And uh, as I said, it's a magnificent place for shorebirds. The Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve, um, is in Chase County, uh, just, uh, just to the west of Strong City, I'm sorry, to the north and west of Strong City. It's about 11,000 acres, and it's operated by the Nature Conservancy and by the National Park Service together. The National Park Service owns uh, 40 acres of historic building site 
uh, kind of in the middle of the property and they manage that for public access. The trail system on the Tallgrass Preserve is magnificent. You can hike out there all day long and get where you cannot see a single sign of a human being except for your own tracks. It is a fantastic place. The historic house there, uh, I don't know, Laura, is it open to the public now? I know that it, it has been closed in the past and I'm guessing uh, during the current situation, it's not open now. Yeah, so all of the buildings are currently closed, uh, but it is open for people to come and hike the trail system and fish in the catch and release areas. So just a little bit of trivia about this house. The windows in the first floor um, go from the floor to the ceiling. Um, and the reason for that had to do with the way people were taxed for their homes back in that day. And by structuring the windows like that, I, I may have this confused, I think they could call them doors and therefore they weren't taxed on the number of windows in the house. So trivia for you. It's a beautiful place. If you haven't been there, you'll want to get there. I mentioned the trail system there. Uh, and by the way, this is the only park in the U.S., the only national park dedicated to the tall grass prairie. Um, and it is the first national park uh, that, that where the property is owned by the Nature Conservancy. There's about 50 miles of hiking trails. Uh, there's public fishing there in several ponds. It's all catch and release fishing. And um, there are bison on the place. It is just a, th that's a, that's a great uh, capture of it right there. And there are places where you can get truly uh, in seclusion and isolation. It's a wonderful place. Take a little, uh, a little trip down the river now, if I could, away from uh, areas that are quite so publicly accessible. Although, if you don't know, there are str three streams in Kansas uh, that are wide open to public access. If you can get on them legally, you can be on the stream. They're the Kansas River, the Missouri River, and the Arkansas River, or Arkansas, as my grandparents would force me to call it. Um, anyway, the, the, the Kansas River is one of those. About 800,000 people in Kansas, or about 25% of the state's population, get their water from the Kansas River system. It's extremely important to us. It's also a system that's important to a lot of endangered species like the pallid sturgeon um, and the le interior lease tern. Very, very important stream, uh, both to nature and to people in Kansas. It's also a stream that has a lot of problems. Uh, channel modifications, um, runoff, nutrient loading in it, other contaminants in the river are a real problem. And the Nature Conservancy is working with about 20 partners, including the US Army Corps of Engineers, figure out how the river can be operated, stewarded, and maintained in a way that restores it both for nature and for people. The Kansas River is one of the, one of the large rivers in the Mississippi River drainage. Uh, it has a tremendous fishery in it. Um, I've heard stories of giant blue cats and flathead catfish as big as a, big as a person, uh, and I'm sure they're true. It's also a beautiful place of solitude. Uh, my family and I love to canoe on the Kansas River and uh, eat, our, uh, eat our lunch on a sandbar. One thing I've noticed is, regardless of what the temperature is, you have to build a big bonfire on the sandbar for it to be right. But, uh, we really enjoy the Kansas River. It's a fantastic place. I'm guessing that um, if you're like most people in Eastern Kansas, most of the people on this uh, call right now have never been in the Red Hills which is an area that includes Barber, Comanche, and Clark County primarily, a little bit of Southern Pratt County, extends about from the city of Medicine Lodge, not quite to the city of Liberal. Um, and it's an area of about 2 million acres. Um, and the Red Hills are uh, one of the most ecologically rich parts of Kansas. Down there in the lower left corner is a lesser prairie chicken, a species that probably the science says should be listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. One of the reasons, one of three primary reasons that lesser prairie chickens are in trouble is because of eastern red cedar trees. And you can see a few of them. They're native uh, to Kansas. You can see a few of them scattered out there. But where there are very many of them, lesser prairie chickens won't nest. They won't live. In addition, those same eastern red cedar trees are stealing grass from ranchers, stealing water from streams, and threatening structures with catastrophic fire. Depending on whose study you believe, uh, eastern red cedars are costing the economy of south central Kansas 
North Central Oklahoma, about a billion dollars a year. So the Nature Conservancy recognizes if we get rid of eastern red cedars using good ecological management practices like prescribed fire, we can bring back lesser prairie chickens, we can restore streams and the associated aquatic species, we can make ranching a profitable enterprise and restore the economies of some of those struggling little communities in that rural part of Kansas. I grew up in Pratt County and so I have an especially soft spot for this beautiful area called the Red Hills. The flowers in the foreground are Gaiardia or Indian blanket, some people call them. It's also called the Gypsum Hills because the rock outcrops there are, are predominantly uh, gypsum. Uh, one of the ecologically threatening things that goes on in the, in the Red Hills or the Gyp Hills is gypsum mining uh, for wallboard primarily. Over on the right hand side of your screen, uh, there's a sign that says St. Jacob's Well. Uh, that's actually in a property on the very far western edge of uh, the Red Hills or Gypsum Hills in uh, Clark County. It may span the line a little bit into Comanche County as well. It's a place called Big Basin Prairie Preserves. The Nature Conservancy acquired it, uh, I think, in the 1980s and uh, transferred it to the Department of Wildlife and Parks, which operates it for public access. It's an absolutely fantastic area. One of the things that I love most about the Red Hills is the streams that are there. Many of the streams in the Red Hills, because there's not a lot of tillage agriculture, it's mostly grazing, and it's mostly grazing done well by the ranchers there, uh, many of those streams are pristine. They look like they did 500 years ago, and the species that live in them are, are still in very good shape. One of the things that the Nature Conservancy um, has quietly done over several decades in Kansas is to um, help protect ecologically unique and important places that we never even put our name on. I mentioned Big Basin Prairie Preserve in the Red Hills. In Northeast Kansas, just south of Kansas City is Meredicine National Wildlife Refuge. Um, Meredicine came to be um, in large part because the Nature Conservancy lobbied for it helped raise the money to get uh, so that the federal government could acquire the area. It's on the Meredicine River and that one of the unique features of this area is something called uh, green tree marshes. So when we talk about wetlands and we'll talk about some more before, a lot of people think of Cheyenne Bottoms with grass that runs right up to and into the water. The ecosystem at Meredicine being a green tree marsh or a hardwood marsh they're sometimes called, uh, has a lot of areas where the trees are the predominant vegetation up to and even in the water. These trees uh, that uh, produce acorns and walnuts and other uh, mast or nuts are extremely important to migratory waterfowl in the area because the, their, their crop produces a lot of energy that the waterfowl and, and other birds, other animals need to migrate and to survive the winter. Uh, so in 1992, the Nature Conservancy led the effort to establish this area. Um, it's, a, as I said, it's bottomland hardwood uh, along the Meredicine River. Um, and it is an extremely important uh, migratory bird area that's actually outside of the, the principal central flyway. Uh, Meredicine, by the way, stands for either river or marsh of the swans. I think it, marsh of the swans, according to my notes here. Um, there's hunting and fishing and hiking here. Uh, and it's also a really important area. Oh, this is the dedication day, the grip and grin day. Also a really important area for reptiles. Uh, there's a diamondback water snake eating a fish. Uh, mallards there are the principal uh, waterfowl species there. Also a really important area for mussels. And that is noteworthy because mussels, um, because of their life cycle, because of how they survive are some of the species that are the first to go when water becomes contaminated or limited. Um, because mussels produce a larva that's very vulnerable in the water uh, when they're lar in their larval stage. And because so much of their habitat and so much of their life cycle requires on filtering water of a certain quality and finding sandbars and mud, mud banks of a certain quality. And when streams are channelized, uh, or otherwise altered, those habitats are lost. Meredicine is a really important area. 
I don't have a lot to say about these areas, except for these are examples of a couple of other areas where the Nature Conservancy has helped conserve lands, in this case, a couple of wetlands that we don't really have our name on. The McPherson Valley Wetlands, uh, which lay just a few miles uh, west of the town of McPherson. Uh, there's a little over 4,000 acres of wetlands there, um, frequently inhabited by whooping cranes and eagles, and like this avocet, which appears to be stretched a little bit side to side. What do you think, Laura? And then Jamestown Wetland, up near the city of Concordia. Uh, this is a wetland complex of three or 4,000 acres that was almost completely drained at one time. And uh, the Nature Conservancy has been an investor in the restoration and protection of Jamestown. And as you can see from that picture, it's a hugely important area to migratory birds. Also open, open to public access year round. Quivira National Wildlife Refuge uh, is an area where we haven't had a lot to do with uh, acquiring and protecting land, but we're working really hard right now to work with irrigators uh, in the area to figure out how agriculture can continue, continue to thrive and Quivira National Wildlife Refuge can continue to get the water that it needs to provide habitat for species like these whooping cranes. Quivira um, is, is probably uh, next to Cheyenne Bottoms or maybe ahead of Cheyenne Bottoms. It's certainly equal to Cheyenne Bottoms in terms of its importance for migratory birds. Um, Again, it, like Cheyenne Bottoms, many of the birds that stop here travel all the way from Canada to the southern tip of uh, Argentina and Tierra del Fuego. The problem at, at Quivira National Wildlife Refuge is that um, Rattlesnake Creek, which provides water for the refuge, which provides habitat for the migratory birds there, is also source water for an important irrigation agriculture economy uh, on Rattlesnake Creek. And the groundwater that the, uh, that the irrigators need there is directly associated with the water that flows down the creek. So when the groundwater is pumped below its static level, uh, the creek stops flowing sometimes, sometimes at crucial times for the wildlife refuge. We believe that the science and the economics exist to allow the irrigators to continue their farming enterprise or agricultural enterprise and gets Quivira National Wildlife Refuge the water that it needs. The irrigators there are, are a bunch of progressive-minded people who wanna solve this problem. One of the interesting uh, uh, circumstances here is that the water right that Quivira National Wildlife Refuge has is senior to almost all the irrigators. So uh, the National Wildlife Refuge, uh, I guess theoretically has a legal right to have irrigation water shut off. The US Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't want to do that. We don't believe it's necessary and we believe that we can come to a to a win-win solution that keeps the refuge healthy and the irrigators in business. I'm getting towards the end here and um, I want to talk just a little bit about the Blue River in Kansas City. Uh, the Blue River is important to us for many reasons, one of which is it drains uh, a large agricultural area and then flows into a large urban area. And the Blue River has many healthy stretches on it. Uh, development is rapidly advancing on the middle and lower sections of the Blue River. Lots of building going on in that area. Some of you may be familiar with it, where it flows through uh, Kansas City suburbs. And we believe that with proper urban planning and some land protection, that it's possible for the Blue River to continue to yield the recreational benefits, the human benefits that it's had for, for decades and decades. Um, the Blue River uh, is home to uh, a great diversity of fish. It's important to some migratory birds. And um, we believe that it can be protected and restored for people and for nature. It's a beautiful place. There are access points to the Blue River. Um, uh, Quindaro is one of those, if you haven't been there. And that is the end of my presentation. I have no idea how long I went. Be glad to take questions. All right, folks, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask away. I have one, actually, Rob. Um, is there any camping around Little Jerusalem Badlands or is that not 
allowed. The, there is no camping facility immediate little, immediate little Jerusalem, but Scott State Park is only about 10 minutes away uh, to the south. And by the way, the drive across country from Scott State Park to Little Jerusalem is an in breathtakingly beautiful drive. There's nice camping facilities at the state park there. And so the answer is yes, you just have to go a little ways from Little Jerusalem. Rob, I have a question. Um, was out at um, not Little Jerusalem because it wasn't open at the time. I'm trying to come up with it in Scott uh, Scott City, um, the other chalk formations. Um, but anyways, we were trying to take pictures at night of the Milky Way over the chalk mm -hmm. formations, and um, didn't have much luck. We actually got run off because <laughs> I that's on private land and. You know, you could see the animal tree range, and um, unfortunately, people do dumb things, and it ruins it for a lot of people. So, if you were looking across Kansas, and I'm unfamiliar with the Red Hills, being from Kansas City, uh, but also uh, was for Little Jerusalem, uh, can you get in there 24/7? Can you be there at night? And is there a good spot to photograph the Milky Way from? Little Jerusalem, so looking south, southeast. I'll, I'll let Laura respond to that because she's working with wildlife and parks, but it is not open at night. Yeah. Okay. Right. The Little Jerusalem is, is open during daylight hours only, although um, from the start we've been speaking with wildlife and parks uh, that we wanted to have some special events where we could uh, have night sky viewing, uh, night sky photography. We realize you know, the needs of photographers are going to be different than someone who just wants to, to stargaze and observe. Um, and we are planning those in the future. Um, the first one was unfortunately, you know, canceled with all of the other cancelizations right now. So I'd say just uh, keep keep watching for those. We are going to to offer them. Um, one place that um, does have twenty four hour access is Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve. Uh, there is no camping there, but you are um, welcome to go out uh, and hike the trails at, at any hour. And so there's some really great um, night photography opportunities there. Shot it. That's over near the lower schoolhouse. We've shot there before in, a nest in the Red Hills. But uh, thanks for clarifying because uh, it was Monument Rocks and mm -hmm. the landowner was very nice. And you can see we had quite a, quite a barrage of um, photography equipment. We weren't spray painting anything up or going to do anything odd, but um, unfortunately somebody, it sounded like, uh, ruined a great thing for a lot of people. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And, and frankly, I, I didn't mention it when I was talking about Little Jerusalem, but uh, the Nature Conservancy had two goals there when we acquired the place. One was to protect the geological and the ecological features of the place, and the other one was to provide public access. And we not only worked with the Department of Wildlife and Parks, but several subject matter experts um, about how do we develop and operate the place uh, so that the public access isn't a detriment to the ecological or geological features, largely because the Narrabera chalk formations are very, very soft. Uh, and, you know, if someone got in there with a couple of ATVs or, or dirt bikes, they could do a lot of damage in a hurry. And so um, that's why it's not open at night, just because the potential for vandalism and damage to the place is very, very high. Okay. Fair enough. Hi, I have a question. This is Charlene Burton from Topeka, Kansas. Hi, Charlene. General public, uh, is it handicap accessible? There are handicap accessible facilities, including a handicap accessible trail uh, at Little Jerusalem. Okay. And That's my it. next one is, is there any place near there for a bicycle trail? I believe Scott State Park has some bicycling in it. Uh, there are probably some municipal areas that do as well. Laura, do you know? Yeah, Scott's, Scott's Historic Lake Scott State Park um, has a pretty widespread cycling. Um, the, the accessibility of the trails at Little Jerusalem, it, you can take a look at, at our website, nature.org slash Little Jerusalem, and there's a picture of the um, packed crushed rock surface um, of the trail um, 
to the to primary overlook and get an idea of um, if it's something that, that you'd be up for traversing. Thank you. It's about a four tenths of a mile walk and you're looking at it from the east end of Little Jerusalem. So you're looking out to the west. Uh, and it's not a bad view, not as nice as the other two spots, but um, it's about a six foot wide trail if I remember right. Yes. And if I can say one other thing, uh, the gentleman that was asking about um, spots like Monument Rocks to, to shoot the Milky Way, there's a place called Castle Rock yep. that, uh, as far as I know, is accessible at night. Um, yes. If yes, you want to shoot the Milky Way out someplace dark. Thank you. Um. <laughs> You can access Castle Rock south of Collier, off of Interstate 70, also south of Quinter, although you don't have the views that you have if you take the Collier route. And then right in line with that are the Monument Rocks, which are east of Highway 83, south of Oakley. And then Little Jerusalem is on the west side of the highway. Also, Keystone Gallery is right in there, kind of just off the highway. Also, Buff's Buffalo Ranch is to the south side, and they will give tours if you call ahead. Uh, there's also an excellent museum in Scott City, and they will do uh, battleground reenactments at uh, Scott Lake because um, our uh, senior group from Hayes has gone out there and they've given us a tour and it's very interesting. There's but a lot to do out there. wasn't open yet but they told us about it so I really want to get back out there to see it. And I kind of grew up in that area so so it's kind of almost like home. Well, you might know this then. Um, there's a lot of speculation about where, where and when the term Little Jerusalem arose. Um, and to the best, uh, the best, most credible story I've heard is that uh, some of the early Europeans out there who looked at that said, gosh, those look like the white walls of the city of Jerusalem. Exactly. Uh, that's, and, that's the same yeah, story yeah. I've heard. There may be a better or truer story, but that's the one I know. Yep. Well, that's what I've heard too, is that it's reminiscent of the walls in the city of Jerusalem from a distance. Other questions or comments? I might have missed this. Are there petroglyphs or any um, Native American or any early human inhabitant kind of uh, ex you know, markings or art or anything out there at, at Little Jerusalem? I'm so glad you asked that. Um, to my knowledge, there are no petroglyphs or Native American uh, uh, art there. However, uh, there is an incredible fossil resource there. Another reason why it's not open uh, at night, uh, including uh, giant clams. Clams is, as uh, clams this big around there. And um, mosasaurs, the giant toothy fish. Uh, if you've been in the Natural History Museum at Hayes, there's a mosasaur yes. there. Um, Came from that area. Yeah, many, many, many uh, fossils uh, at Little Jerusalem and at Smoky Valley Ranch. Well, you'll see a lot of that at Keystone Gallery. Chuck Bonner, who lives there now, his father and George Sternberg are the two people who help uncover the fish within a fish that is on display at Sternberg Museum here in Hayes. Yes, thank Rob, you. Rob, there, there are. Also, there are Indian ruins on the south side of Scott Lake that have been uh, somewhat restored and shows where the Indians lived back in you know, several hundred years ago. And it's quite interesting. Uh, 
actually they're Puebloes is what they call them, but they're a different style than what you will find in the, like out in Colorado. Thank you. There's, there's, also, there. there's also an old town along uh, the highway. It's called El Cater. And about all that's left is the remnants of a filling station that my great uncle operated back years ago, probably about 100 years ago, but 90 years ago. Um, but then that got flooded out, so that was the end of that filling station. But there's a lot of uh, people have, you know, left their initials on there <laughs> through the years. Robert, how does one uh, get engaged, donate, support the Nature Conservancy if, if we're new to this? Or am I, am I t stealing your thunder? No, you are my thunder now. Um, so th thank you for asking that. Um, the Nature Conservancy uh, needs that kind of support, probably more now than ever. Um, and thank you for asking. Uh, we are supported largely by um, philanthropic gifts, um, and if you go to nature.org, it's really, really, Ill, really easy to uh, make a donation there, or uh, you can send a check to the Nature Conservancy in Kansas, uh, and the address is at our website. Um, thank you so much for asking that. We, de we depend on our members and our donors uh, uh, almost exclusively. Hi, uh, this is Mark Clark from Manhattan, Kansas, and I'd just like to give a plug for uh, Nature Conservancy. I've been a member for a few years or two, um, and uh, love the magazine and in my travels through the Midwest and Arkansas uh, up through the North Midwest, I always tend to uh, gravitate towards uh, properties that the Conservancy has purchased and, and that have public access, obviously. And it just really warms my heart to see the the work that's being done. So, um, you'll uh, you'll feel good about yourself when you do join the Nature Conservancy. Um, it's a great organization, and they do great work around the world, of course. But here at home, it's really heartwarming to see. Thank you. And so thanks much. very much for this um, Zoom broadcast. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Anybody else want to uh, shill for uh, donations to the Nature Conservancy? I, that's, that's amazing. I, well, Allison, I have no idea how much time I burned because I just uh, I got rid of my phone when I came in here so it wouldn't ring or vibrate. So I have no idea whether we're over time or under time. We're doing great. It's actually 749, so we have time if anybody thinks of any burning questions they want to ask. This is Alexis from Kansas City on the Missouri side. Hi, Alexis. Uh, <laughs> hi. Um, I am excited to go out to Little Jerusalem. Will this presentation be, it's recorded, I see, but um, where will we be able to access it? Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, Alexis, I am going to do a Facebook post with the link to the recording, if I can. Um, this is my first time recording a Zoom since venturing into virtual programming for the first time in the library's life last month. Uh, so I will put it out there and then um, Rob and the Nature Conservancy, I'm going to send y'all the link as well. Um, and so if uh, I don't suppose you're on their email list or anything, right, Alexis? Yeah, I am. You are. Okay, so yeah. then that way if they would like to do it, send it out that way, then you have two places to get it. Um, so either uh, the Olathe Public Library Facebook page right after this, or perhaps later down the line uh, through an email blast from Nature Conservancy, if they want to. Thank you, Olathe. That'd be great. Thank you. Well, 
if there are other questions or comments, I'm glad to stay on as long as anyone does. I, I would just say this in closing that um, the current circumstances um, in my mind illustrate how important nature is to us, not because it's where our, just because it's where our food and water comes from, but because it's so much of our emotional and um, intellectual sustenance comes from nature. And uh, personally, I would say more now than ever, it's important for me to be able to breathe deep in a quiet place. Um, it's important for me to hear the sound of a running stream splashing over the rocks and to hear birds and to see migratory waterfowl fly by. And those, those experiences all come at a cost. Um, and the existence of people and healthy economies and vibrant communities is really compatible with the existence of a healthy planet but it takes work and it takes purpose and it takes resources and it takes people like all of you who care. Uh, so I, I'm so uh, humbled by the fact that you would spend an hour with me doing this, that some of you would, um, I, some of you I should hire as fundraisers probably. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you would uh, shill for us like that. And uh, I, I'm really humbled and greatly appreciative uh, of your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here. But again, as Rob said, if, if y'all have further questions, we officially end at eight, but I don't mind keeping the meeting open uh, if y'all want to talk. So, Allison, I just want to thank you for doing this. This has been great. And it's wonderful to, I, I'm kind of a new board member, so I'm still learning. I, I'm not kind of a new board member. I am a new board member and I'm definitely learning. So this has been great. But the nice thing about this is that you're recording it. I have a lot of friends who would love to see this and couldn't tonight for whatever reason. So I really appreciate that because I'm going to push it onto them because I think they really want to know more about Nature Conservancy. So Rob, thank you for what you've done. And Laura Rose, thank you for what you've done. But Al, definitely thank you for putting this up there. We really appreciate it a lot. Oh, I'm so glad that you did. I am thrilled with the content as well. So yay. Good, good, good. All right, I'll go ahead and stop recording here.